It's beginning to look a lot like another episode of the Careers Mayor podcast, and not just any episode of the Careers Mayor podcast, but the Christmas special episode of the Careers Mayor podcast. I am here with my lovely Christmassy co-host, Jordan Andrews, who is, I'm sure, absolutely brimming to the top of his little ginger hair with the Christmas spirit. Is that right, Jordan? Oh, uh, not really, mate. Oh, well... What, what what's what's up i don't know i just i feel like i'm i'm not really getting it this year i'm not really feeling the the christmas spirit i don't want to put too much of a downer on the uh on the episode but i just if there was something or someone that could just lift my spirits a bit and um give me the christmas cheer i i don't know i'd really appreciate it wait hang on do you hear that what's that it couldn't be, could it? Oh, 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 oh. It's you. I'm so glad to see you again. On my travels, I've been having so much fun that I said to Mrs. Claus, look, if you come and make sure that you just keep out of the way a little bit, you can just check and find out how the majority of those people are very nice. Now, big mistake. I chose Glasgow to introduce her to some of the lovely people that we have around. And you know what? They are lovely. But we went to a place called Govan and the children were practicing for their Christmas party. (laughs) And they started singing that song. Well, let me just remind you about that song. It starts like this. Well, when Santa got stuck up the chimney, come on, join in, he began to shout you girls and boys won't get any toys if you don't pull me out my beard is black there's suit in my sack my nose is tickly too achoo 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 oh wow thanks santa wasn't that lovely boys and girls (laughs) It sure was. Oh, well, I hope I get all my presents. I've been real good this year, Jacob. You have? Uh, Yeah, I really have. I brush my teeth twice a day, every day, and I'm never late for work. Well, I'll tell you who will be the judge of that. It's our guest on today's podcast, the wonderful, marvellous, Christmassy Paddy Hanrahan. Paddy is many things, um, but principally he is a working Santa Claus. He lives up in Scotland, but he's originally from South Africa, and he's worn many interesting hats, apart from a Christmas hat. And I think that you're going to love hearing from him, and hearing his voice coming through your speakers is going to feel like sitting in front of a crackling fire on a snowy Christmassy morning. Now, bring on Santa, bring on Santa, bring on Santa, bring on Santa. Santa. Welcome, Paddy, to the Careers Mayor Christmas special. How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, yes, thank you. And I hope you've both been good boys. <laughs> I'd know, of course, I would know. <laughs> and and the reason I would know is not because I'm checking up on you, because I can't take my eyes off you, you're so fantastic. <laughs> So, Paddy, uh, we know that you're currently a working Santa, um, and we'll come on to that job uh, in due course, but we normally start right at the start of your working life. Uh, I know that you live and work in Scotland now, but you're not originally from Scotland, is that right? I'm not. I'm I'm South African. I was born in, in South Africa, and I lived there till I was 20. I then moved to Ireland, I joined a religious order. I I felt called to a religious life as a priest. So I went to I went to Ireland. But this was after quite a lot of life experience. You know, I had I had been conscripted in South Africa, had been in the army, 
ostensibly fought a war. Um, and it was really during my army service that I had a real conversion in the sense that I met when I was up on the, on the, the border in the Caprivi Strip, which is an absolutely fascinating place. It's the only river in the world which flows into the, into the desert. It doesn't flow into the sea. It's the Zambezi. And, it, and it's caused a massive swamp with wildlife all over the place. And uh, there were a group of Dominicans over there who were, were busy kind of working away, very, very well-educated Dutch Dominicans. And uh, being the South African army and being under the old apartheid regime, you know, they used to um, uh, insist that you uh, observe Sundays in some sort of way. So I got the fortunate position of being kind of bust in to go and have mass at uh, this Dominican place. But, uh, you know, that was where I, I really began to think about. Well, I, before that, I began to doubt the whole apartheid regime and, and what we were doing. You know, so. so what was your like early life like growing up in South Africa at that time? For a you know normal white um, South African, I was I was in a segregated school. Uh, Cotton Jones High School was my my last uh, uh, secondary school. No black people were allowed. They had an inferior education system, and I suppose just being a typical teenager, just really interested in all the things of teenagers. But you know, I began to to develop um, a conscience, and um, I got my matric. Um, it finished at the at the beginning of December. We had our holidays, and then on the eighth of January, I was conscripted into the army. My year service. It was only a year in those days. It later went to two years. I started exploring the possibility of going in and being studying as a priest, and I applied. And of course, the the, the academic year is different in in in, in Ireland over here. You know that. It works from summer to summer, or well, from fall to the beginning of summer. So I had a year, more or less about a year in between, and uh, a friend of mine managed to get me a job on a gold mine. You know, so oh, wow. uh, a job yeah, on a gold so, mine. Yeah, well, I lived in a gold mining town called Cartonville. You know, the mine that I worked on was West Treefontein, and I was a work study officer, and it, it entailed, you know, having a look at, you know checking how people would were working and trying to suggest ways of making it more efficient and and all sorts of things a fascinating experience um yeah please i'd love to hear more about that i mean how how does a gold mine work like what how do, yeah i, I want to know <laughs> i don't even know where to start <laughs> yeah 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 cartonville it's called marafong now you know, since the, the transition from apartheid. But uh, Cartonville had some of the richest, well, it had the richest gold mines in the world. Now, the only problem is that they were pretty deep. And some of the mine, some of the mines, you would have a shaft going down as far as they could possibly go. And then you would get a, a train, uh, like a little locomotive that would go through a big tunnel to another shaft and then you'd go down it so you were working at depths of about a mile down and of course the gold comes in a kind of a reef so you have to you know you have to take a fairly sizable bit of ground which then you know gets pulled up and taken to the surface and crushed and everything like this but it's a very slight wreath you wouldn't you wouldn't really notice it with the eye but the, you know the wreaths were pretty good and there was a good basis but because of the depth there would be immense pressure the stopes that you worked in had to they had to go very fast because it was beginning to close up after you so you know the, wow. you, you had two shifts they would drill these holes put the explosives in get out of the way go up and the explosives would go off and then the the next shift would come in, clear the way, and you know the next drilling process. So it was forever going forward. And then the other thing is that uh, using explosives meant that you had cracks, and so you had a very high casualty rate. If you had a thousand hours of shift working without a fatality, I'm not talking about an accident. Then we had a massive party, and only went to <laughs> one party in the whole year. You know. Yes. Wow. Sorry. You know, yeah. But I shouldn't laugh, but that is 
having a party in a gold mine because you've gone a thousand hours without anyone being killed. Oh, well, we didn't have a dance down under the I wasn't in the gold mine. It. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. it, was, it was above ground here. Uh, <laughs> there were probably more people killed after that party than were killed on the mine, you know, because it would be very heavy drinking. And, of course, everybody <laughs> drove in those days. So oh, my gosh. There, there yeah. were all sorts of... Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was fast living, and because... It was so dangerous that work. You know, people had a, you know, they had a, a fatalistic attitude to life, you know. But the majority of people that got killed in the mines were black people. And they weren't uh, native to the areas that we came from. You very rarely got Zulus who, who wouldn't, you know, they were considered beneath them. So they got their workers from Botswana, Mozambique. Lesotho, which is an independent country landlocked by South Africa, Swaziland. Uh, and these these people came on contracts. They would, could only stay for a year, and they were signed on. Uh, we were all taught a language called Fanigalo, which is a kind of mixture of Afrikaans and Zulu, mostly Zulu. Um, but it's kind of um, an Esperanto of the of the African nations, and that's how we communicated with each other. Can you give us a bit of a bit of that? What was it called? Funny, funny galore. Funny galore, yeah. Funny yeah. galore. Yeah. Oh, when I would tell them, when I would hamba lapa when sabenza. Okay, you go there and you work. Okay, right. <laughs> oh. It was a very efficient way of of teaching you, but of course, before you went down the mines because of the heat. You had to go through a climatization process. You know, you used to have to stand on. It was an area that was like a big sauna, and you had to do all sorts of exercises so that you climatized. Because otherwise, if you just went down the mine and started exerting yourself, you could end up with heat stroke. You know, and still, you know, even after climatization, lots of people did. So of course, you had to take a lot of liquid, liquid mixed with uh, salt and and sugar. You know. Um, but obviously, it was only in, you know it's only maybe probably in the last thirty years that we've realised just how dangerous salt is, um, mm, you know. Yeah. And and so, and then of course the other big disease was tysis, which is a disease of the lungs because of the fine dust that was created from underground. You know, so they tried to keep things as wet as possible, and and obviously the other thing that they did is that every ten minutes there would be massive slides of ice that came down and there was a massive fan in front of the ice just to cool things down but even then it was still very hot i mean if you're a mile underground you're in what we would call hell you know so mm. so that was it yeah. being a soldier then <laughs> being being a yeah. miner yeah. although i wasn't a, a physical miner as, as such i was studying other people working the people that they had as operators on the on the drills they were big guys mostly from lesotho and Lesotho is high up in the mountains, you know, so they're, they're, it's Cartonville is about 6,000 feet because it's on a plateau, but they're even higher, you know, so massive lungs on them, massive builds on them. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a few of them in their rugby team now that are Sotho, but not, not from Lesotho, you know, in the mm. South African rugby team. Yeah. You, if you have a look at some of the rugby players, they're, they're massive, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> you know and I mean, they, they, somebody said they were mutants, you know, and they said, well, <laughs> how did you get that big? He says, meat. Eat lots of meat. <laughs> yeah. I worked for a while in the mines and then got a job as a personnel manager or personnel officer on a, on a big chemical company in, near Johannesburg. And by this time, I mean, I had met my wife in, in Scotland while I was on on the trip there was not there was nothing really strong about that but she then was working in Botswana but when I found myself trailing up to to um, Francistown which is up right up north on, on what was just a little road I mean it was a riverbed basically it was it was there was it's not as developed as it is now to see her I thought no uh, there's something going on here so we <laughs> we, we got married um, so, so you had you went for a trip in Scotland, and that's where you initially met your wife. Met her, yeah, right. Uh, we okay. went. We we had a house just down the road from us in in, in Gla from, from Glasgow. They had a we had a a, a retreat or a monastery in a place called Coodham, and uh, lots of young people used to go to this, and that's 
that's basically where I met her. And we we kept up a correspondence, but uh, but uh, like and the rest was sort of history. Yeah. Mm. And it was uh, our, our our first son was born in um, in Johannesburg. Uh, we got married over here. We came over, got married here, and then went back to South Africa. And uh, my first son was born and was it was then that I realized the pressure that Mary was already on, uh, you know, apart from being away from her family. Um, but when when Julian was born, it was my my oldest son, um, she'd been on pethidine and, uh, you know, they said, congratulations, you have a son. And she kept saying, He's not going into the army. He's not going into the army. And of course, they were laughing, you know, because he uh, oh, was wow. only, you know, just born. And yeah. that was down to the fact that I had managed through some of my American friends when I was in Ireland uh, to kind of jip over the service, you know, because once you've done your military training, you have to do like the Israelis do a uh, three month camp every year up until a certain age. So I'd managed to kind of confuse them as to where I was, you know, um, and just, you know, some of the ideas of Peace Corps workers and Vietnam, uh, you know, avoiders that I met in Ireland, you know, so, so I'd managed, but I was terrified, you know, everything that had a uniform on it, you know, especially a red uniform or a red hat, you know, the red caps, uh, just terrified me, you know. And so when I first came to Scotland, I was, Bus conductors frightened me, you know, anybody mm. with a uniform. Because I was, so you, I was. You still went back to South Africa, even though you were worried that you might be, or well, I guess, arrested for avoiding your conscription. Well, yeah. Uh, by this time, they had they had lost track of me completely. You know? and, right. Uh, okay. You know, um, so I I wasn't that worried about it, but also I couldn't stay uh, in in uh in ireland um right yeah, yeah. For, you know, i mean mm. that was kind of um and i suppose at that point i was kind of looking for something you know a bit more secure you know, so, yeah so i went back and and, and you worked you know, in this chemical plant i worked in a, yeah as a, a personnel and of course you know um uh, there were two, again, everything was segregated in South Africa. There, I was working, recruiting white people uh, into certain jobs, and uh, and lots of jobs were protected. You know, artisans, uh, you couldn't, a black person couldn't become an artisan. Some agreement with the white unions, you know, and, uh, you know, so I was recruiting white people, and there was a separate person who was doing, you know, the, the black workers, again, a, a white person, you know. So everything was just absolutely segregated. You know, it was, um, you know, some of my friends that I had met, um, some of them from Botswana, and uh, you know, if because I couldn't fly to Botswana direct, and they would arrive in in South Africa and maybe have a day between their flights, and it was it was almost illegal. Well, it was illegal to have them staying with you, you know, and. Um, really you know, wow. yeah so just for our listeners who might not know a lot about apartheid south africa and how that all works like what what was it like i mean of course we know that there was a lot of segregation but what was it like in you know like could you you know have friends who were black without that or would that be seen as being kind of um antisocial or whatever like what what was the general kind of um, atmosphere like in South Africa then? Yeah, you you could have. You weren't technically supposed to go and visit friends in the what they would call the locations or the townships, you know, like Soweto, which uh, um, it it was considered to be uh, it was illegal unless you had a absolute valid reason for being there. Quite a few of them worked in there. And, you know, in Soweto, for example, you had the the main electricity um, generating plants were in Soweto because they were massive coal-burning um, towers that were stuck in the middle of this uh, massive township, which had over a million people in it. Uh, 
and uh, a lot of the workers there would have been white, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, as soon as apartheid ended, they closed them, you know. And they're now big, they're big towers with one wonderful paintings all over them, you know, just as a thing. But you can imagine, you know, in in the winter, when you were driving past Soweto, where black people were forced to live, they couldn't live in in the white townships unless they were domestic workers that worked for a white boss. They could live in a little house that, or, or a room, not a house, in the back of their properties. But that was on condition. And black people had to carry a thing called a pass, which meant that, you know, it said whether they were entitled to be in that area, you know, and the police would arrest them and stop them and test, check their, check their documents. And if, if their document wasn't up to date, they would, they would take them to jail, you know, and uh, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable to a lot of people, really, that that was, you know, um, and, and you know, you were saying that when you were, you know, when you started working, you and, you know, you were developing a conscience and you began to get a sense that even though it's what you'd grown up with, that it was wrong. Uh, was that common for people of your age at the time or were you an outlier? I was, I had experiences which kind of changed things for me. There were, there were quite a number of people a lot braver than me. Um, my cousin's son uh, who's a priest now, um, he, when he got conscripted, he refused to do it. And he applied to be a conscientious objector. And, uh, you know, Catholics weren't allowed to be conscientious objectors. So he had to do double the service that anybody else did. And they gave him a really, really hard time. He ended up teaching in, in, in some black area, but still, nevertheless, you know, they would do things like uh, when they were, I mean, military training was absolutely barbaric. You know, they would chase you up and down hills, and you know, there's a hill behind a shooting range, which is made of sand to collect the bullets. And if anybody in the squad, when you were shooting, missed the target altogether, they stopped. You know, you unloaded your rifles, and then you ran up and down these hills in the middle of the heat. You know, so they would be doing this, and they would have the, they would have my my cousin Zane and. Uh, and the other conscientious objectors sitting there in the sun drinking lemonade, you know, and they would say, see, that's the conscious, you know, so they were just provoking them to attack them, you know, so they had a hard time. And they were a lot more braver. I mean, I, 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 I would say I was, I've essentially been a coward or, well, not a coward, but I, I avoided confrontation and found confrontation very difficult, you know. Um, not to say that I was that quiet. Uh, I was involved in, in activities. Um, but being quite a scared about the fact that what I was officially doing was, was I had uh, managed to, um, how can you, disappear in the system. You know, simple systems that they taught me in America, what they said is you do the official things, you register them, okay, and then you register every letter that you write to them, and you just write crap, you know, rubbish. You just write, you know, things about the Civil War in in, in the United States, and you make it a long thing, and then you send that every week, you'd send that, and you'd record it, you know, so that eventually when they would come to have a look at your pack, they would pick up this load of rubbish, read the first few pages, and say, that's a lot of rubbish, and they take the official things. So it was just it's a simple idea, but that's how you got, you know, how you escaped in those days before computerization. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so. so, yeah, yeah I did. Uh, I, I, it's hard to describe to people. I, I was, we were scared all the time, I, re I remember one night we there were there were parties where there was mixture, a mixing of blacks and white people. Um, the the people that were most um, conducive to them were people that would have been the Church of England or Anglicans, uh, and I found as a whole Anglican priests and, and Anglican um, monks and nuns, I found them much, much more challenging uh, of, of the system. And, you know, some of our friends from, from groups that we, we went to, uh, they, you know, 
they would openly kind of mix and they would openly uh, have multiracial um, congregations and things like that, you know, so that, uh, uh, you know, they they were a breath of fresh air and they give us a freedom. But nevertheless, I mean, one night we'd been to a party and some of, some of the people had come back to our house and uh, I had a few books which were banned officially. And, uh, you know, I was pretty, pretty drunk. And I went past and there was a man of what they would call coloreds or mixed race. And he was standing there and he'd only picked up some of the books that I knew to be banned. And I sobered up immediately and I said, I think we'd better go and leave the party. And, uh, and he was saying, no, no, fine. And I said, I'll give you a lift. You know, it was just like instantly, uh, nothing ever came. I never got raided or anything like that, but you just were suspicious of everybody. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, it's, it's just, it's pervades everything. Mm. Um, I guess it's hard, yeah, it's hard to imagine for people like me and Jacob having to just live with that constant fear, being so distrustful of people. But, but you also met people, you know, you, like, uh, you know, even in the army, I'd met this Afrikaner and he was a real Afrikaner and he came from the Cape and, you know, big, big physical guy, great rugby player, Dries Poisson. And Dries, you know, when we came in, we were just terrified. When when I arrived there on the 8th of January, they met us at the station and they started screaming at us, you know, and cut our hair off and gave us this uniform and then put you in a room and said, right home to your mother, not your dad, because your dad was kind of expected to be quite willing to give his son to the, to the struggle, but uh, right to your mum. I post that off and I wrote one one word. It was, dear mum, help. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, Dries, Dries arrived and these guys were always shouting at us. We never slept on top of our beds because the bed was had to be you know, square and everything. We slept under it. Uh, but Dries would lie there and this little man would rush in and start shouting at us, you know. And Dries would just look at him in an African and say to him, Wach, and you, you know, what do you think? You, you know, just bugger off, get lost. Mm. And I used to think how you would have that kind of independence, that that refusal to kind of bow to this basic little corporal who was really essentially educated, you know, he would just, you know, write them off. But of course, because he was such a great rugby player, they, they never really disciplined him at all. Uh, but I admired people that, that had the independence. They could just say, I'm not going to be like them. Yeah. See. So your son was born while you were working at the chemical plant, is that right? And That's then right. Uh, what happened after that? We decided to come back to Scotland, um, still very, very fearful of uh, them kind of doing some investigations and finding out. And I heard so many stories of people taken off planes just as they were off to, about to take off for, for Europe, you know. We kind of uh, did things that made it look as if we were just going on holiday. And, right, uh, yeah. But as it happens, they knew all about me anyway, and they sent me a tax uh, refund before the return part of my, my ticket was, was due to come, so, so I, knew, I, I knew that. Oh, right. So, that, wait, sorry, what do you mean? Who's, who sent you a, a, re, a The Inland refund? Revenue, you know, the tax people. Oh. Sent me a, in Scotland with my right address. I mean, and, really? Uh, you know, wow! So it, that was just to let me know. We know who you are. We know what you are. Just <laughs> shut up here. So. How do you think it, they found out your address in Scotland? I don't know. Maybe from the passport place. But uh, you know, I mean, I used to go to extraordinary lengths to try and hide because I did go back to South Africa during the years of apartheid. We didn't go as frequently as we do now. You know, they had the systems. They weren't all that clever. I think, you know, whenever they interviewed me or, or picked me up, not for military things, you know, for other things that they thought I was up to, they they got a lot from me because I was so scared, you know, and I thought that they knew more than they did. But then, in, in, you know, in, in, when I look back, I was telling them things. And you mm. you do strange things when you're scared. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I was terrified of them, yeah. yeah. It's hard to imagine uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that all of it was real. I, I think I was paranoid as well. You know? and, uh, but that, that's exactly what they wanted, isn't it? 
fear fear is well fear is a good controlling tactic but only for so long yeah well it, it certainly kept me quiet when i first came to scotland i still a little bit scared and i you know i kind of curtailed some of my activities but but later on because of people that i met here in the anti-apartheid movement and uh, i then had the courage to join it and uh, you know I, I was doing quite a lot of campaigning mostly in the in the catholic church you know and uh, managed to get the the bishops of scotland uh, together with some other people not south africans but uh, other groups in the justice and peace group to to get the bishops to um agree to a statement on sanctions against south africa you know so um but still kind of scared that you know they, they would discover that or do something to my family because my mom and dad were both back in south africa but uh, nothing really happened by that point south africa from 1976 you know when you had the had the uprising in soweto you maybe heard about that when uh, the young people refused to to do their subjects in afrikaans which is the language of the oppressor and they marched on the street and they they violently attacked these young people killed i think 3000 of them over a, a few wow. months but um, a, a kid was um, Hector Peterson. He he was supposedly the first child that was was shot by the the police, and a picture was taken of his lifeless body, and his friend was running to try and get him help, but they'd shot him with a dum dum bullet, and you know, so he, the whole of his back was out. He was dead, you know. And, uh, but that picture went viral, went all over the world, and that changed things. And the the, the you the you know the the young people in South Africa, unlike the the elders who were still basically kind of you know keep quiet, just get on you know you you, you won't be able to get a job or they'll cancel your passport and send you to to one of these bantustans. But the young people, they just had enough you know, and it wasn't mm. particularly about Afrikaans. It was about you know they were making it very difficult for a, a black person to get an education. You know? And it was just too hard, you know. You had to learn in English and Afrikaans and not your own language. You know? And especially the subjects like maths and science and, and things like that had to be in Afrikaans. You know? But that changed things, you know, because the young people were saying, nah, we're not doing it, you know. And, you know, they were kind of actively refusing to play ball with that system. You know? So they had bigger fish to fry and, you know, and lots of my relatives uh, who had done, you know, my, my brother-in-laws um, um, were called up and, uh, and rather than being called up to do service on the border or in Mozambique and uh, Angola, they were going into the townships, you know, and uh, the kids were, you know, pelting them with with rocks and things like that and they, they 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 then began to discover that there was something really wrong you know because we were told and lots of them were told that you know the africans prefer that you know they prefer to be told what to do uh, and you know even even now 30 years later after freedom you hear i still hear white south africans saying my servant or my, my one of my workers says, I wish it was under apartheid anymore because I mean South Africa has, as you would probably know, got a lot of problems. Yeah. So, um, as you know, there's massive problems to do with with corruption, but it's also got to do with the fact that the funding, you know, the the, the infrastructure was made for maintaining white supremacy, for maintaining military prowess and and force in in South Africa. And, you know, the, like the infrastructure, you know, black people didn't have electricity, for example. And, you know, so now you have massive power cuts because it's still the old coal burning plants, by and large. There's one or two plants which are, are different, but, you know, they, they just can't meet the demand. So you have load shedding and it's, it's massive. Yeah. Hmm. So it yeah, was so. it was Scotland was when you formally got involved in the anti-apartheid yeah. movement that's right yeah did you ever did you ever go back to south africa as part of that or was it more from no, afar no, no. in scotland you were getting involved in those kind of activities yeah no i did go back to south africa um and i 
we we went as 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 a family. Um, I went to South South Africa and on a, on a few occasions, about every two or three years, you know. But just as a private citizen, no, uh, you know, I I kept my nose clean. Um, but by that point, you know, the uh, the apartheid regime was just beginning to fall apart. You know. Mm. You know, so mm. It was. I mean, it, those were the last days. They just didn't know it was the end of apartheid. You know. But you know um, the the young people, the young people in South Africa, um, they showed a way, you know, and a whole new breed. Mandela mentions that, you know, that when he was on the island, he noticed a massive difference with the, the younger people that came to the island, you know, because people of his age and my age, uh, you know, had kind of even though they were they'd rebelled against the system. They, you know, kind of still half, um, well, cooperated. They felt that, you know, what you did is you learned Afrikaans and you, and you kind of kept your head low, you know. But Mandela had that way of kind of affirming everybody or everything that was good in the people, you know. He, he had that philosophy, which is basically, you know, which is basically a very good philosophy to have. You know, you, you ignore the rubbish that people give you. You know, you ignore the the horrible pe- thing about people. You just concentrate and you try to find them doing something good and praise that. You know? And you only address the noble in people, you know, that kind of philosophy. Whereas the young people that he saw coming to the island, you know, again, like me, he, would, he was really a great admiring of them because they just refused to speak Afrikaans. You know, when the wardens who were, you know, were all white wardens in Robben Island, when they addressed them in Afrikaans, they ignored them. You know, so, you know just said them speak a mm. proper language, and of course they got beaten up and things like that. But that point of cooperating with them, that was over. You know, and uh, so apartheid was was crumbling. And apart from anything else, you know, the sanctions beginning to bite. The uh, they just couldn't keep up the the military struggle anymore. And uh, and businesses essentially that's what makes the big difference. Businesses were 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 meeting the ANC in exile, you know, the African National Congress. You know, so it it was a completely different climate. You know, um, you know, and I could see that you know when you went when you went back to South Africa that that was different. And we 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 obviously we had some friends who lived in Soweto. And there was a, just a, a different climate, you know. Um, you know, you didn't feel as scared when you you went to visit them or even stayed with them uh, as you did before, you know. So, because things were changing, you know. And uh, and you know, when you went into the kind of shabins, the drinking or the bars in, in Soweto, they were more interested in Celtic and Rangers than they were <laughs> in the politics. You know, <laughs> you know, the, the football has always been a, a great thing. You know, so uh, it, it uh, you know, so. So, what was next um, for you af- after that? Well, when I came back to Scotland, I, I, uh, it, it was at the kind of, it was at the point that Maggie Thatcher was taking over, in, in Britain, and you know that thing about Britain isn't working, and the first job I had was in the cleansing department, you know, literally sweeping the streets and, uh, and uh, uh, working on the bins. So I, I did that for, I think it was the only job I could get. Uh, I did that for about four months, five months. I, I, I forget, but I, it was a sizable amount of time. I, I just, I need money, and I, I worked, and then I enjoyed it, you know, because first of all, learning the language, you know, and because uh, <laughs> they spoke English, but uh, I, I had to kind of uh, adapt <laughs> myself to to to. To the to the things, and also just well, to kind of discover the culture. You know, yeah. And, what were some uh, language linguistic things that you struggled with? Well, <clears throat> in in South Africa, when you know we, we after we after we got married and we were back in South Africa, there there was no television in those days, and the entertainment that some of uh, the Scots people had with uh, 
with me was they would play Billy Connolly. I don't know if you know Billy Connolly. Yeah. 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 Very, very funny. And he would use Glasgow slang. And they would say, okay, and Billy Connolly would play something and they'd say, well, Paddy, you say it. And of course, when I try to say it, they just laugh at me, which is torture. You know, I mean, <laughs> so even even today, I can't do. I can do a few accents, but I can't do Scottish, you know, or Glaswegian. You know, anyway, what accents so, can you do? <laughs> Irish, I picked up, you know. And, oh, go uh, on then. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm telling you. Okay, you'll not be doing this, all right? Okay, you'll well be. You're a good Cadillac, okay? <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a storyteller as well, you know, so. Mm. Uh, you know, so uh, Was that the Enniskillen accent? That's, yeah, Belfast, yeah. yeah. Basically, basically. <laughs> and, and quite a number of the stories that I do tell are about some of the i mean i found i found belfast just working there as a student i found that really revolutionary because the first summer that i went to work in belfast um, there were some houses that uh, had been burned down because um, the belfast council had had uh, re designed them as Catholic homes or nationalist homes, okay? And rather than allow them to have it, they, you know, the Protestants burnt or the, you know, the, the loyalists burnt the houses down and we were building them up on a sort of project, which was lots of different students. But I met a lot of, you know, uh, Belfast workers on that site. And the fascinating thing, and, and, and some of them undoubtedly probably IRA and, uh, uh, they were reading things like uh, Talia de Chardin, who's a philosopher and, you know, existentialist stuff and all this. Very well kind of educated. And so that was quite a revolutionary. And, and uh, yeah, and, and also, you know, the struggle itself, just, you know, the, um, you know, what was going on. I had, you know, I had to kind of really question a lot of assumptions you know, that I had about um about everything you know and see another perspective you know um you know so so that was revolutionary but mm. um you know but that was during my student days I, I never really worked i worked on play schemes and all sorts of other things while i was in belfast but once i came here i worked on the cleansing and then i um got a job in what is called a residential school it's 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 a uh, they were called listy it was a special school for children that were in trouble um and you know and sometimes have broken the law but in the kind of system that we have in scotland where you have a children's panel rather than a children's court for them you know most of them were sent there one or two of them had been sent for under section 413 which was a criminal code for for offensive and were sentenced to sometimes so i started working there as a care worker and uh, i was fortunate to be sent to, back to university to to do a course in um it's a, a a degree in social work and uh, uh and then i came back and i was later promoted or i applied for and got a promoted to being the deputy head in, in charge of education and then later on uh, I took a post as a head of another residential school, which was um, near us in Airdrie. Uh, and, uh, you know, while I was there, I, I built and, and, and was involved in a project to build a secure unit, which is for children who have been convicted and, um, are, you know, of, of crimes and are locked in uh, or, or children who are persistent absconders from other places, you know. And uh, that, so that was really quite another experience. Yeah. yeah so well, so is, is that where your work with children first started? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I've always been interested in working with children. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'd say um, it, it, it developed there and mm. uh, it, it was also i mean one of the courses that we did while i was uh, studying for my social work one of the electives i took 
was a special course in learning how to communicate with children. Because obviously children say things and they mean something completely different to what adult, adults say. You know? so, um, and, and I found that changed my whole perspective on working with children. Yeah. Mm. And then, you know, we were, we, were, we were lucky enough to have three of our own and, uh, um, and, and have now got uh, five grandchildren. So, you know, the art mm. of speaking to children is something which I'm, I'm constantly learning. You know? and, uh, uh, oh, I, I love speaking to children. Um, I mean, in, in the role that I do working in a job center, obviously we get a lot of parents bring their kids in and there's just su there's such an honesty to children that I feel like you lose as you get older. Um, they'll, they'll just say anything that comes to mind yeah, and it yeah. never fails to amuse me. It's, yeah. bri it's, uh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, I remember this one boy went to, when I was in, in, in St. John's, which is just up the road from me, and uh, he wanted to join the army. And he went along to the recruiting. I took him along to the recruiting sergeant. And the recruiting sergeant said to him, why do you want to join the army? And he told them he wanted to kill people. And the guy got very upset. <laughs> he said, I want to kill people. The guy said, "You, what do you think we are? A bunch of psychopaths and threw him out. And I thought that was quite a good answer. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. It, it, um, it was challenging. Uh, the job that I had been in terms of kind of directly working with with young people, uh, it was quite different because being in management was was you being able to kind of lead people to to do things that you were able to do. You know, uh, so it's a different skill set that was involved in that. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I, I by and large, I really enjoyed it, and I was always conscious that uh, my real skill was in kind of working with people um, and that uh, I had to model for uh, for people that were working for me the kind of behaviors that I was looking for and uh, I was also very lucky in the sense that uh, I had two people working for me uh, well uh, um, you know towards the end of it who were deputy, one in charge of education, because it was also an educational establishment, and the other one in charge of social work. Uh, Brian Harold was in charge of social work, and Dennis Ferry, uh, another very gifted young, and we had a very gifted team. And we actually spent a lot of time just talking about the value base of the system rather than, you know, the procedures and policies and all that sort of thing, and reiterating, you know, the child first, policies you know and and um you know and how to deal with with difficult and challenging behavior and because uh, we had a lot of children who i suppose what you can say is that they were you know when they were born people failed to catch them if you like you know and they've been falling ever since really and by the time they got to us they had uh, you know really an intense mistrust um, a lot of a lot of dislike for authority, especially for police, who you know they had come across, and you know. But essentially, you know, they 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 just had to have a healing process that kind of helped them to kind of recognize that uh, you know uh, people were people, and uh, that you know some people really wanted to help you, and of course, you know, they tested you very very severely because they didn't, you know other people that said that to them and uh you know they, they they just wanted to make sure that you were the real thing you know because they hadn't mm. really come across that you know because a lot of times people were kind of talking down to them making decisions for them and uh, uh not kind of hearing i suppose is the big thing what they really wanted to say or giving them the opportunity to say things so um and I suppose the way I did it was uh, through telling stories, yeah? um, and you know, which I developed later, 
uh, you know, in, in, in my career. When, when a children was in crisis, you know, when he was acting out, uh, there was boys that we worked with uh, up until that point. It's now since gone uh, co-ed. But uh, um, when, I, when, uh, when a child was really acting out, being very violent or having to be restrained and all that sort of thing, uh, sometimes they would let them escape to see me. <laughs> and uh, uh, it it was a way of kind of diffusing them. So they would come in shouting, screaming, and all that, and I would just begin to tell a story, you know. And uh, you know, we go on, and then I knew I'd got them when they contradicted. I'd make a deliberate mistake. They contradicted something, or they they said that crap, you know. I knew then that they were engaging. And there's something about stories that does that with with people, you know. You. You know, they want to know what's going to happen next. You know, yeah. And they, mm. and they, you know, so they, they, you know, they, um, they begin to kind of get in, involved in the story. Because when I do formal storytelling in groups, I always say there's two rules. One is that um, every story is true, and then some of them actually happen. That's the first rule. <laughs> and the second thing is, the story really begins when I stop talking. And people kind of look at me and say, well, that's a bit daft. But the idea is the story is a gift and you're inviting people to take that gift, to make it their own, and whatever they do with that story after that is their own. And so that happened with kids. You know, so. so were these stories that you would tell from your own experiences or stories um, from other people? Or? Yeah, it's a combination um i in in the storytelling forum not with kids but the, the the storytelling forum i suppose where my name has mostly been made is that i've i've told stories i tell stories and take the real cases of the truth and reconciliation commission which happened after the ending of apartheid um, because just before apartheid before the 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 first free elections in south africa the old defense force and you know security forces and the police had uh, gone to the ANC because they knew they were going to win. There was no doubt that they were going to win. And they said that they wouldn't police the elections unless um, they were given uh, amnesty for the crimes that were committed. Okay, and I mean the the you know the ANC had a whole network and. Um, of lawyers and legal advice, and they said, no, we can't do that. But what they did offer them was a uh, Peace and Reconciliation Commission, which was which was headed by um, uh, Bishop Tutu at the end, whereby if people came forward and, you know, admitted what they'd done, named what had happened, you know, and, and asked for, um, for amnesty, from that they could be um, you know they could be could be given it so there was a whole series of of trials some of it really horrific you know because the things that they were admitting to were just absolutely inhuman and you know it wasn't always accepted very well by a lot of people especially you know um, um, the victims of some of these crimes in the sense that they would say they got away with it. But what actually happened was a process of, you know, in telling their stories and admitting their case, there was there was a healing that was happening, you know, taking responsibility, which a lot of them didn't. You know, the majority of them didn't. You know, they still held on that they were fighting a war, uh, you know, and that that's, you know, everything was okay. Um, but the ones that went through it went through a process which was was amazing so i've taken some of those stories and uh, i tell them and i tell it mostly from a perpetrator which is an unusual thing in storytelling uh, from their point of view um, and trying to you know to demonstrate that uh, there's a kind of cathartic or healing bit about you know confession if you like uh, you know bishop tutu is from the anglican tradition like like the Catholic, they still have a confession process, and it's about admitting, you know, that you've done great harm, and that you're uh, that uh, you're seeking, you know, forgiveness, 
which you know lots of people just never mm. get to. You know, so, so I've so I've, I've done that. Um, the other story is, of course, because of my background and the African background, with kids I would tell, um, you know, stories involving animals. Uh, you know, it's it's a good way of uh, of you know. First of all, letting kids into a world which is quite different, and you know, a world in which animals are are uh, like us. You know, they think and they talk and they and they they feel and 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 that sort of thing. And uh, it's 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 just a um, it's it's a kind of wonderful way of kind of and also teaching really essential things, things like you know, being honest, uh, being able to be trusted. Uh, you know, which is one of the fundamental things about being trusted is if you admit, you know, that you made mistakes or that you did something wrong. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so that's that's the kind of idea. It's, it's funny how, you know, um, you know, I've, I've over the years, you know, since I've retired and and uh, I'm no longer there, I meet grown up uh men who 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 themselves have families and quite often they would ask me to tell them one of the, one of the stories that i told <laughs> and uh you know and i would say which one you know which one but i know exactly and it's this it's a story about uh about a process in in in, in a lot of cultures but in south africa it, it's still uh, predominant and it's called a system of initiation whereby you know you 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 go into the bush for a while and you know you, you learn the stories of the tribe you learn about the history of the tribe and they put you through quite a few tests uh, the thing that's most controversial about it is the the circumcision which they which often accompanies it and it's it's uh uh, and for that reason, it was kind of it. That the idea is that you know, uh, it's only in having your wounds, and it was during the time that you wounded, that you get uh, you get taught the most important things about you know, uh, being a man, uh, being a male, uh, being you know able to kind of accept suffering and 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 pain, and and also, you know, the respect for. Um, you know the other people. I suppose it's what you would we would, would call um, um, compassionate connectivity. You know, because very often, if you have a look at our society, the trouble with with a lot of politicians and a lot of churchmen, you know, in senior positions, is that they've never grown up. You know, they, they mm. they're still kids, and they think the world surrounds them. I suppose we all laugh at Trump because that's exactly what he does. You know, he he just hasn't hasn't uh you know he hasn't he hasn't grown up and you know, i think a world centers around them and it's being able to grab you know that that compassionate empathic i suppose is another word that we use and um it's just realizing that other people think like you that you know other people have the same desires and needs that you have you know and uh and uh you know so so but so with the sorry the did you find a lot of success with with the storytelling with the kids in these in in the well it, it depends on what you mean by success <laughs> uh, i would uh, they would also know the children knew that when they came to me that the you know as soon as they'd calmed down and they were in a, a space which was you know prepared that i would call the person that had had the um had the problem with the, the child and that we would have a three-way meeting or maybe a four-way meeting and that you know we would also kind of try and learn from what we could have could have done better but that required a certain amount of maturity from people and including myself you know admitting that he didn't always find that easy as well you know um, yeah yeah so yeah i say there was success but maybe not just immediate in the sense that you know you think, ah, oh, well that's it. You know you've you you've you've transformed a situation which is very difficult into a, a much more uh, cooperative situation. Uh, but the but 
that would happen at a later stage and it might be repeated again okay but if you consistently did things that way you know and uh, you know the trouble would be to kind of react or um, respond and you know nowadays in, in in you know not only in children but in 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 working with with adults and especially with prisoners they've they've got this thing called restorative justice i don't know if you've heard of it it's it's, mm. it's a system whereby the victims and the perpetrators and you know uh, and very often the prisoners would engage in a discussion and it's it's about just you know reaching out for the humanity in everybody yeah? Um, and uh, I suppose the people that find it hardest are the victims, you know, because they, they, you know, they're having to, you know, they'll, they'll come in. It takes a tremendous bravery for them to do. But it's a system of, you know, in which you get people talking and hoping that they actually kind of reach out to the humanity in people. You know? so, so, yeah, uh, uh, that's, that was a very happy time. I didn't like the politics. Okay, I can tell you that uh, I retired uh, a year early because um, I just found, I mean, I was also going through a personal crisis at that time, but I just found the politics of the situation too difficult. I, I, I was employed, uh, our managers were appointed by the Catholic bishops of Scotland, it was a Catholic establishment, and uh, I didn't always see eye to eye with them, and I found that I was misunderstood. And and eventually, I kind of got up because it was taking a tremendous toll on me personally. You know that that kind of interaction uh, was taking a personal, um, and uh, uh, it also corresponded to the time that my dad died uh, and my mom died uh, in 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 a kind of situation. And there was there were some unresolved things that I had to really sort it out. And of course, with the medical system, you were giving pills, you know. And I just found I was reacting physically wrong to those. And uh, I was fortunate. I, I kept on holding out and held out. And I was fortunate to get three years of uh, psychotherapy. And it was the old style, you know, Jungian stuff, sitting on your or Freudian stuff, lying on a couch. Never saw the therapist because they they worked out that I was quite good at reading faces, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was weekly, and it basically saved my life because you know I was just my body was really giving up, you know. So so it was about halfway through that process that I asked and got early retirement, and uh, um, people said you will never manage it because I used to get to work early. And uh, you know, come home late. Uh, you'll you, you'll you'll be back again. But I I didn't because I hadn't I had learned um, I'd learned you know the whole system of letting go. And I I learned a little bit of humility humility that I couldn't I just couldn't keep up. And uh, um, and so you know that that saved a lot of things. My marriage, I think, as well, mm. you know, and <laughs> and and also the my kids who then were quite grown up by that point, you know, got a dad back again because uh, uh, you know I was so busy because I'm kind of figuring that the thing to do about when you're getting, you know, uh, you know, when work is getting you down is just to work harder, you know, work longer, and you know, and everybody, you know, all my, all the people that worked for me. Uh, you know, in retrospect, I could see they would they would just say begging me to go and do something. You know, because they like me. You know? So yeah. Anyway, so but, I was I was lucky to get that, and as I said, it saved my life. Yeah. But we know that you uh, we know that you have kept busy in retirement. Yeah, <laughs> I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with the storytelling, I moved that to a different level. There's a, a story telling centre in Scotland. It's based in Edinburgh on the Royal Mail, and uh, I joined them and got a local groups, and we have a, a regular meeting. And I've been to Canada and done storytelling there and some other places. But uh, it's it's something that has changed things. Getting to be Santa Claus was an accident. Actually, what happened was uh, I was shopping 
in a place called Dobie's. Uh, it's a garden center. But the reason I was there was because they had they had a butcher there who made burrovos, which is a sausage that we all have on our barbecues or, or braise, as we call them. And it was the only one in Scotland that, that I knew of because it's, it's mixing meats, which has got some dangers in terms of health. For it. And I was in a hurry because the place closed at four. And this woman said to me, you look like Santa Claus. And I said, what do you mean look like? I am Santa Claus, you know. <laughs> and she, and she, she said to me, because I just wanted to get away, she said, would you be interested in doing Santa Claus? And I said, well, just hold on, let me go and get my my brother's. And then she came to me and she says, would you be interested? And I said, well, I don't want to be tied up for the whole of December. Oh, she said, no, there's three others that do it and you'll be doing it in shifts, you know. Ah, I said, yeah, give me the form and I'll, I'll fill it in. Well, I hadn't applied for a job. I mean, I hadn't filled in an application form for a job for something like 40 years, you know, so I filled this in, not too convinced that I wanted to do this. You know? I hadn't put things on like my address, my phone number was there. I got this phone call and she said, uh, is that Santa? And I said, yes, this is Santa. And she said, <laughs> Uh, where do you live? I said, everybody knows the North Pole. You know? And she said, no, quit this. My boss has already told me to bin this blooming application. You know? She said, but I think there's something that you can. So kind of would you come in and, you know, they, they had a, an open night, which was in sometime early November. You know? And uh, would you come and do the stories there, you know? And she says, my boss will come and see you because he wants to see you before, you know, so. So I, I was busy telling the stories, kids, and having a really good time. You know, the kids were all coming and we were just kind of jokingly, you know, just letting kids dance and sing and that sort of thing. And along came the very serious manager of the store, and she's standing behind him, you know. So, and he looks at me and says, oh, so you're the one that wants to be Santa Claus? And I said, yeah. Have you been a good boy? And she's going, <laughs> and he says, now let me just put this, let me just say to you, okay, I am 50 or something like that. My kids are all grown up, okay? And, you know, this is just a load of nonsense, so I'll have, so I said, I suppose that's a no then. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened, but he, he asked me to come. And I learned a lot. Uh, I, I also learned I just don't like that grotto thing, you know, with cues of kids and, you know, come in, mm. what do you want, mm. you know, photograph, you know, that kind of factory attitude, you know, because I was the only one with the real beard. I also had this accent, South African, it sounded different, which I told everybody was from the North Pole. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but they, you know, the, you had five families to see in 15 minutes, which meant that each family got three minutes. Yeah, and, it's not enough, you know, is it? And very no. quickly, and I just, I just, I thought this is just rubbish. You know? And, and the, you know, the boss would send the elf in to say, tell him to hurry up because <laughs> there's people outside crying. And I'd say, well, that's no, I can't have kids crying. So I would go out in my uniform and say to them, okay, do you want me just to, you know, come in, photograph out? Okay, with this little crappy toy, or do you want? No, no, we want what everybody else has. Had. <laughs> so I said, you might be going to be waiting for a while. Why don't you go away and come back? You know, and the manager's going absolutely furious. You know, but then I found out what was happening is people. The word got around, and so while I was supposed to be seeing five families, there were more being stuck in from the groups of the other centres. Not that they were that bad. It's just that. I, I I kind of got a you know within quite it, it helped a few South Africans had come and they were speaking Afrikaans, so I just waited <laughs> until you know until they they had really stuck themselves in and then started speaking to them in Afrikaans, you know. <laughs> so so the word got round and I I was doing well. And as I said, I learned a lot, but you know at the end of that I said, look, I'm not going to do this again. You know, it's it's. Just what did you learn? Mind. 
Well, you know, I, I, I increased my skills in talking to children. I learned that you know you could you could challenge some of the assumptions, especially when parents were coming and saying, "Can you tell him to do this? You know, can you make you know using me as a social control?" You know? mm. I turned that around very quickly on on parents. You know, so I learned that that, that was okay. You know? And again, the other thing of empowering children you know, and letting them be children. And the truth be told, the thing I also learned was the key to getting a child to relax is to get the parents to relax. You know, because they were often very taut and very upset because they probably didn't have such good experiences with Santa. So I would I would tell silly jokes and, you know, get them all laughing or practicing mm. laughing and singing and that sort of thing, you know. So, yeah, it was quite intensive, you know. I, I found working lots of hours. You know, so. so what was the, the very first time you ever did it? What was that like? Um... It was quite frightening. But, you know, the trick of Santa is when I'm dressed in that costume and with the beard and the accent and, you know, with the with the big ho, 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 <laughs> I'm quite convincing. And really, I could, I could be reading a telephone directory and they, you know, so you look like it and, you know, the kids are put into the atmosphere. And then when you're kind of doing, you know, something different, and also listening to them in a in a way, you know, because because kids would be, you know, they'd be drilled, you know. They, first of all, they want to sit on your knee, and uh, I learned first of all, you never tell them that you can't do that. What you do is you just gently move them off, okay, and uh, and they would they would say, I want, I want, I want. Hold on a minute, I'm Santa, <laughs> you know. Hold on a minute, I know. Okay, I'm not really interested in what you want because I know what you're going to get. Okay, <laughs> but you convince me if I bring you a present and it's going to like you best, the present will want to come. Okay, what do you do? You know, tell me the things that you do that are kind, that are fun, you know, because I don't want to bring a, a good present to a house where, you know, you're going to shout at them or you're you're nasty or you're going to neglect them, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing. So, that kind of learned and I learned I learned lots of stories you know from from the kids which I used I suppose after Dobie's I got a magic certificate it's it's a certificate from Santa to say that they're on my nice list you know and uh, oh well, I uh, wish I had one of them oh well, well you'll have to work hard at it but, <laughs> but the, what it and and this really made a massive difference is I got a glue pen and I, I put feather on it and, you know, made it up like a real old pen. But it's, essentially it's a group pen, you know, they're using crafting. And uh, I would say, okay, after, you know, a little bit of interaction, now let's just check to see if the magic pen is going to make sure that you're on the nice list. You know, again. And I'd write their name out, you know, and it's got to be exact, you know. And it's and then I've got a glitter mixture and we sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and the glitter's coming down on it and it's gonna stick okay it's, yeah it's, you know I knew it but I would keep it there and I say you know flick it you know I don't know this one's telling me that you've been really very good it looks like you're through it you know and of course uh, you know make a big drama and then I turn around and their name is up on us you know and the kids go like this you know but of course you would often get parents saying i'm surprised you know because i would be surprised you know in fact you know you get much more choice words used you know that's insane because there's no way that rory could be on the nice list you know the the other thing in terms of presence i just i suppose that's why adults or parents quite like me was that uh Try to get kids away from this kind of consumerist thing. I want, I want, I want, you know, uh, or gimme, gimme, gimme. And uh, over the years, I kind of developed a way of kind of giving them the idea that really the present was quite involved in this process, you know. Uh, you know, that the present would actually say to Santa, I really want to go to Johnny's house or Mary's house mm. because it's a nice house, it's a friendly house, you know, it's, uh, you know, people speak to each other, people are kind. And, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then I would tell him the sweet story, right? Okay, I want you to close your eyes. All right, okay. And then open them, all right? And then, you know, if you do that three times, if you close them tight and you open them, you'll see stars 
now we're getting into the zone, okay? <laughs> and now, right, you've got an idea of what your present is. You've got an idea, and so you draw an imaginary picture in front of what that picture is like, you know? of what that thing is, the colors, and, and also how it makes you feel, you know? And then I say, right, when you open your eyes, I want you to grab that picture, lock it in there, lock it in there, okay? And you hold it, okay? That's the present you really want, okay? Are you sure? You know, and they say, yes. And then I say, okay, this is the secret of Santa, okay? If you hold it in your hand and nothing else can do, and you don't want anybody else to have that present, and you just want you to have that present and hold him, that present gets just like reindeer poo. Have you ever smelled reindeer poo? <laughs> okay. It gets sick and it doesn't, you know, what you have to do is you have to let it go. You've got to let it go and it'll go to Johnny's house and it'll go to Peter's house and Mary's house and go up the stream and down the road. And, you know, and of course, when we sing, when we tell them about this, they would sing that the boys hate it, but the girls love it, you know, from Let It Go from Frozen. Oh, you know, let yeah, it, yeah, 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 let it go, you know. You know, of course, the boys, I'm not doing it, but then they get involved <laughs> quickly because they realize there's something at stake. <laughs> and if the, and the present really likes you, I'll know where to bring it, you know. So that's the sort of idea. And that's, that's how I got into being a celebrant because it's funny. One of my, I've known this, this woman for years. She's, she's, she's the founder of our organization, but she's a well-known celebrant all over Scotland. You know? And she, well, so, so Jerry, um, Douglas Scott, um, had said to me, I've married two of her sons. And uh, this woman is in a hospice at the moment, and she's she hasn't got very long to go. She's very ill, and uh, her dying wish is to see Santa. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? Oh, she says, you know, the, the thing that she'd done, she'd seen or she'd heard about some of the some of the things I did, because after I left Derby's, I started doing on my own restaurants, and I also did home visits and things. So I went off to see her in, in the hospice, and she had a little granddaughter uh, who was about three years old, I think three years old, and she's just delightful. And, you know, the woman was very um, sick, okay? And the nurses and doctors, and they were all hiding behind the, uh, behind the, you know, the screens, or one or two were there, you know, but uh, they, they just thought this was wonderful, you know? And so we did the whole thing, and we did this thing about let it go, if you really want something, you've got to trust that that something will come to you and you let it go and you'll get something really nice. It might not be the one that you thought, it might be something else, but you'll get something that you'll love. You know? So we get to that and we're going to sing Let It Go. And, you know, hands up and we're waltzing around and uh, myself, her dad, her mother, her mum wasn't able to be there because she had a cold. And uh, so we we were waltzing around saying, let it go. And the sick uh, woman asked, she pulled me down and she said, Santa, I love my life. I can't let it go. And, you know, I cried, she cried, because mm. there's no answer to that, you know. It's just wrong. I mean, it's just, it's so horrible. And I suppose that's what compassionate connectivity is. And, um, but she revived and I'm not saying it's got anything to do with, with me. Uh, you know, quite often people have that, you know, even very sick people have a a period of where things get better. That's why cancer can be so cruel. You know? And uh, she died about five months later. And Jerry, who had already undertaken to do a funeral, had she was going away on a long-term holiday, and she said that uh, the woman had said, could Santa do it? Well, of course, I'm saying, you know what? You know, Santa's got a problem with chimneys, okay? <laughs> and, you know, crematorium, I wouldn't wear my suit, you know, it's too dangerous, you know? <laughs> so, but anyway, I, I went to see the family and I, I, was, I was given a crash course by Jerry and Susan in, in doing funerals. And that, that was my first ever funeral. And uh, I just... It it was just so special and such an honor to be involved in in something so you know intimate and you know by the way 
since that first occasion, which was about eight years ago, every Christmas I see at least two or three people in hospices, um, you know, uh, and it's, it's, and people say, but isn't that depressing? And it's just the most amazing experience out, you know, it really is, uh, you know, as Santa, I mean, I go there mm. as Santa, you know, and, uh, I suppose it's celebration too, and that's how the way I see Santa as well. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, the truth be told, there's not many people, not even children, maybe when they're very young, yes, but who really believe in Santa because it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's not logical, you know. One of the kids, um, I was doing this story, which I'm, Mrs. Claus heard them singing that song here in Glasgow about Santa got stuck up the chimney. And she said to the woman, you know, the Glaswegian woman, what's that song all about? And, you know, t a typical Glaswegian woman says, if my man was getting stuck up the chimneys, I'd send him to Slimming World. I said, well, you don't tell Mrs. Claus that, okay? <laughs> because the very next thing she sent me to Slimming World, and I don't like it because you can't have pies. And then I get a kid saying, oh, and you can't, you know, or you can have one, but then you can't have anything else, you know, and, and all this sort of thing. So... I get the kids to, they, they sing the song about Santa got stuck up the chimney and I'm selling them. And I said, Mrs. Claus, if I don't eat the pies and the carrots and, and Rudolf doesn't eat the carrots and all that, you know, the, the children will be sad. They'll think that Santa doesn't love them. <laughs> and Mrs. Claus put her hands on her, sh on her sides and she said, she came up with a crazy idea. <laughs> you know what she said? She said, you eat the carrots and you give the pies to Rudolph. And I said, Rudolph's toast for like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm busy telling this kids and everybody's laughing and we're having a lot of fun. Okay, and I want you just to tell Mrs. Claus she's gone. So ring your bells and make a lot of noise because she's probably having a wee sleep because she thinks a happy hour is a nap. You know? <laughs> and then tell Mrs. Claus she's gone too far. And this little kid, and you could see her, she's waiting, she's waiting, you know, and she went, now, let me get this right. I mean, nine-year-old, that's adult language. You know? <laughs> let me get this right. Are you telling me that you eat seven billion pies in one night? Okay. <laughs> and the mom is killing herself laughing. You know? <laughs> and I went, that is the best question I've ever had. Okay. Fantastic. But you should have done your homework you'd realize that maybe there's seven and a half billion people in the world, but about six of those million, billion, don't have enough food for one week, let alone for pies, okay? And I said, and you're good to ask that question because I put them into a magic sack. I don't eat them all, but don't tell some of the kids that get frightened about that. And I said, and some of the houses, I don't even have to do that because you know what happens? Their mummies take it to the food bank and their daddies or mummies and daddies take it to the food bank or the grannies take the food and put it in a special thing in the great bank. And that makes Santa very happy. Well, I got a phone call from the woman after, but she says she's been working that one out for a whole week. And <laughs> <laughs> she says, I don't think she's convinced, but she, you know, so, you know, so that's the kind of experiences you have. Uh, and if you, aren't able to kind of adapt quickly you know if you've just got one little mindset one idea in your head mm. and you know it's uh you know and it's also kind of disrespecting kids you know you know and sometimes i mean i get you you always get you get you know older kids that have been dragged along and told that they got to behave for the sake of their little ones you know and they're doing everything you know their faces you can see i don't really want to be here and then you know, a minute I see that, I would come here, you know, and I'd say, thanks for coming, you know, do you think you could help me? And of course, you know, you're just bringing them in on, on that, you know, you know, because you don't believe, but they do, you know, and it, it always kind of works. Yeah, so. mm. I think it's, it's amazing what you're doing, because from what you've said, obviously the overarching narrative of what you do is to teach the kids about empathy and about kindness and like you say, not not the consumerism side of it. Yeah. Um, so you'd like to think that the the kids go away, and because obviously growing up, I went to Santa's grottos, and it was it was like you say, it's the sort of one in one out, 
what do you want for Christmas? Yeah. Right, have this little thing and and then you leave. But it sounds like with you, they they've they've it's a learning experience and they go away and and they might feel differently. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I, I'm told and you know you you see in my site I've got you know over 3000 followers and I mean followers. <laughs> yeah, I put something <laughs> on it's you know it's immediately they, they, they keep coming in. So uh, um it's something I, I enjoy. I I couldn't do the grotto thing yeah? i just couldn't do it you know and mm. and they, there's a few people now there's about uh, santa claus is higher there's about seven associated with us um i don't employ them they you know they they come and they mostly because my site is so popular we get inquiries that i couldn't possibly meet and uh, you know so they so they work with it but we all agree a set of values Okay, you know, a set of standards, and I mean, one of them is that is that thirty five to forty percent of the work that you do should be free. Um, some people do more than that. There's one guy; he's eighty years old, John Oliver, who works in the children's hospital, and you know, he's he's working every Monday to Friday, every day from eleven o'clock to three o'clock in the children's hospital charity in in the big children's hospital in glasgow uh, what used to be called york hill or it's now called the children's hospital and and he does that you know and he does that for free you know? um, and i've got quite a number of charities that i do i, I work with and one of them is also a hospital it's a, a john uh, john o'burn foundation he's a wonderful little man who who does lots of it's it's almost like you know uh, meeting children's and need um wishes you know, and, and getting them presents and arranging for football um players you know from the two big teams in glasgow celtic and rangers to go and visit kids but very old kids you know mm. and you know so we do a party with them um and various charities like food banks and things like that you know so it's it's about it's about Making a difference, you know, and um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's something I really enjoy. And if I didn't enjoy it, I'd kind of chuck it, you know. Yeah. It's spreading happiness and joy. And, and you know, that's that's uh, really what it's all about, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and as I say, you know, people say, oh, but it's wonderful to see children. Sometimes, actually, you look at the adults and you just see that, you know, their eyes because they're going back to being children again and wishing that they had something like that as well, you know. And, uh, you know, well, people tell me that. You know, this. And I can see it you know? because, as I said to you, you get, the, you get the parents to laugh and laugh is just, you know, laughing is just a way. In fact, we sometimes practice it, you know, go, hee, 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 ho, 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 ho. You know, get the kids and, uh, uh, to, to do that sort of thing. But if you get the parents to laugh, you know, it's, uh, it's an absolute bonus, you know. Uh, you know, and they love the story about Mrs. Claus, you know, especially, and I say to the men, when your wife puts her hands on her hips, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> and, and of course, Mary, you know, quite often you, you're asking for a, they're asking for a double act. <laughs> and I've had sometimes, well, but my wife would never go as Mrs. Claus because she's heard some of the things I say about her. <laughs> <laughs> we always end the podcast with the final section, which is where we try to find out uh, what your dream job would be. So obviously you've had many jobs in the past and you're sort of semi-retired. So looking back now, looking at your life and what you've learned over the years, do you have a feeling of like, if you could do any job, what would it be? Well, yeah, there's a personal thing, okay? Because you know that daddy pig, okay? He keeps telling everybody he's the puddle jumping champion, and he's not. So I want his job. I want to be daddy pig. Just, just for... 
just for our uh, listeners who might not be familiar with uh, Daddy Pig, could you explain who Daddy Pig is? Well, Daddy Pig, uh, he's he's father to Peppa Pig, which is a cartoon that's on there. And, and uh, you know, so I, I, I demonstrate to kids my my puddle jumping skills you know, but that daddy's got too cheeky <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i'm looking for his job yeah. so you want to <laughs> you want to be replace him in the cartoon is that what I you're do, saying yeah also because you know daddy pig's silly okay <laughs> all right he is he is because he, he comes up with some crazy ideas so that's another reason i want his job because you know it's a recipe for being silly <laughs> <laughs> well well you know i think that's the most uh immediate and complete answer we've ever got on the podcast about yeah. what the dream yeah. job was going to be <laughs> and i don't know if we can improve on that so no, i think i think that's it <laughs> so pa paddy i think that's it the next step in your career um after being <laughs> a soldier working in a gold mm. mine being a trainee monk <laughs> working on uh uh working in the uh what's it the cleansing department social work working in a school being Santa, being a celebrant, the obvious next step is being Daddy Pig <laughs> and being, I don't think being the an best like puddle that jumper. The puddle jumping champion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Oh, well, thank you Paddy. so much, uh, Paddy, for being on the podcast. It's been a lovely Christmas special and I feel very Christmassy. Yeah, it's and been an absolute delight. I've enjoyed this. Yeah. Year. And uh, um, obviously, we're recording this in advance. Uh, so by the time you actually listen to this, Paddy, you'll have been through your busy season and you'll be about ready to Hang uh, up my boots. to mm, take mm. off the costume and, and sit down, uh, put your feet up at home and enjoy the, the Christmas period. I'll do that, yeah. Okay, thank you for asking me, okay? I've enjoyed it very much. No, it's, been, it's honestly been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, Paddy. Thank you for doing okay. this. Good night. Oh, 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 well, thank you. Thank you for paying a little bit of attention to poor old Santa. Now, people say to me, how come you're so jolly all the time and you're laughing because that Santa laugh, you know, ho, 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 starts like tee hee hee, <laughs> ho, 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 ho. How can you stay like that all day? And I said, it's because of all the lovely people I meet. Well, I said, there are some tricky customers and some nasty people around. I said, yes, but they don't really bother me at all because the majority of people are nice and they're lovely. And in any case, I'll show you a little trick that I use because it really works with me. It certainly works in the North Pole because we all do this when we wake up in the morning. Some of us, like Mrs. Claus, finds it hard to get up in the morning and she's a little bit growly, but she does this test. She does this little exercise as well. It's excellent. It's like meditation, isn't it? Well, when I wake up in the morning, I go into the bathroom and I look in the mirror and I then put some nice whitening toothpaste on my toothbrush and I brush it 25 times to the left and 25 times to the right. And then when they're nice and sparkling, I take my fingers and I start pulling my red cheeks, make my cheeks all nice and red. Oh, that's it. And then, well, there'll be some of you that haven't got whiskers, but what I do with my whiskers is I pull them and I twirl them. And when they're just nice, oh, oh and I look in the mirror. Now, this is what I suggest you should do. Do what Santa does. I look in the mirror and I say, Gotta say it three times. Santa, you are amazing. You are a miracle that's never happened before and will never happen again. <laughs> and I have to do it three times. Santa, you are amazing. You are a miracle that's never happened before and will never happen again. And then Santa, you are amazing. You are a miracle that's never happened before and will never happen again. And then I go out, oh, 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 walking with attitude, of course, and I walk along and then everybody I meet and everything I meet, you guess what it is? It's amazing. It is a miracle. And 
everything. I look at the trees. I look at the grass. I look at the reindeers. I look at all the things I meet, and especially the people. And it's like looking in the mirror. They are amazing. They are a miracle that's never happened before. Try this. You, of course, you're going to put your own name in it. You're not going to put Santa's name in it. He's already doing it. Try it. I know it sounds a little bit new age-ish, doesn't it? Well, it works for me. I hope that it works for you. And the next time I see you, you'll all be laughing and singing because of all the lovely people you've met, just like you, in that mirror.